Well, good morning and happy Easter. My name is Jason Smith. I have the awesome privilege of being the pastor here of First Baptist Bernie. You're a guest this morning with us. Let me welcome you and just say what a privilege it is to have you with us. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, as we read John's account of the resurrection. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you, okay? You can actually take that as your own. Take it as a gift from us to you, and I want you to keep it so that you can have a copy of God's word. You can hold your spot there in John chapter 20. I will have uh, most of the scriptures on the screen as well. Will you guys pray with me and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, the celebration of the greatest day in the history of the world when Jesus rose from the dead. Father, and all that that entails for us who believe, because his resurrection is our life. His resurrection is the receipt that sin has been paid in full. Father, allow us to see that afresh and anew this morning. Father, if there's anyone here under the sound of my voice that does not know you, God, I pray that they would cry out in faith today and trust wholly in the finished work of Jesus Christ and in his resurrection. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in the days of the Great Depression, there was a Missouri man named John Griffith, who was the controller of a great railroad drawbridge across the Mississippi River. Now, one day in the summer of 1937, John was excited because his eight-year-old son, Greg, was joining him at work that day. So at noon, John put up the drawbridge so that ships could go by, and he sat on the observation deck with his son Greg to eat lunch. They enjoyed crunchy chips and a cool breeze. Greg was full of life and laughter and always wiggling, and John knew to drink in these moments of life because they would pass by too quickly. Suddenly, John was startled by a shrieking train whistle in the distance. He quickly looks at his watch, realizes it's 107. The Memphis Express, with 400 passengers on board, was roaring toward a raised bridge. So he leapt up from the observation deck and uh, back to the control tower. And just before throwing the master lever, he glanced down to make sure that there were no ships below. And a sight of horror caught his eyes. Greg, his son, had slipped from the observation deck and had fallen into the massive gears that operate the bridge. His left leg was caught in the cogs of the two main gears. Now, desperately, John's mind raced with with a, a rescue plan. What could he possibly do? And then he knew that it could not be done. There was not enough time. The train whistle shrieked again in the air. He could hear the clicking of the locomotive wheels on the tracks. And John knew what he had to do. And he buried his head in his hand and he pushed the master switch forward. The great massive bridge lowered into place just as the Memphis Express began to roar across it. When John Griffith lifted his head, was filled with tears and he looked by in the passenger window of the train as it passed by. There were businessmen casually reading their afternoon papers, finely dressed ladies in the dining car, sipping coffee and children pushing along spoons in their dishes of ice cream. No one looked at the control house and no one looked at the great gearbox in wretching agony. John cries out at the train, I sacrifice my son for you people. Do you not even care? But the train rushed by and no one heard the father's words, which recall Lamentations 112. Is it nothing to you, all who pass by? Friend, this true story 
is a great illustration that demands that you and I this morning pause and think about the cost of the cross. That the father gave his son in order to save us. It requires a response. Such a sacrifice cannot be ignored while we sip coffee and eat ice cream. But every illustration breaks down at some point. You see, we must understand that the cross was not some tragic accident. You see, the problem with accidents is that they weren't planned and they didn't need to occur. But the Bible says that the cross was the predetermined plan of God from the foundation of the world and that the death of Christ is necessary for the atonement for sins. Now, these past seven weeks here at First Baptist, we have walked through the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. And when you do, friend, you realize Jesus' death was no accident. Jesus laid down his life willingly. No one took it from him. He understood that it was the necessary plan of God. It is finished, was his cry, knowing that his death was the atonement for sins. You see, without the death of Jesus, there is no forgiveness with God. While Jesus hung on the cross, the crowd, the Jewish leaders, and the Roman soldiers, they all hurled taunts at him. Hey, you claim to be the Messiah? Well, then why don't you save yourself? Why don't you come down from that cross and and then we will believe in you. But the only king who could come down and save himself instead chose to give his life so that sinners could be saved. Sinners like the thief on the cross hanging right next to him who sees all that's happening to Jesus, all the abuse they're hurling at him, and hears Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, that thief believes. He recognizes this is the Messiah. He turns to Jesus and says, do you think you could save even me? Jesus said today, you will be with me in paradise. See, Jesus was saving the wretched thief rather than saving himself. And with a loud cry, he gave up his spirit and breathed his last. Darkness covered the land as an earthquake shook everyone with fear. The crowd who witnessed his death was overcome with sorrow for all that they had seen. His body was taken down, wrapped in linen burial cloth, and he was placed in a nearby garden tomb. Pilate was petitioned by the Jewish leaders to protect the body. And so they roll a large stone over the entrance of the tomb and soldiers are placed to guard. Friday. Saturday, we pick up in John chapter 20, early Sunday morning. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. And she saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, pause real quick. John always likes to stay in the background. And so he calls himself the other disciple. This is his gospel. And this is his account. So Mary runs to Peter and John and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Now, Mary was from a small fishing village off the Sea of Galilee called Magdala. We are dramatically introduced to her in the Gospels by Luke. 
We're told that Jesus was in that region and he had begun his ministries, going through, performing healings of sort, and he meets Mary and cast seven demons out of her. Now, I'd like to briefly sketch for us this morning possibly what life was like for Mary before she met Jesus. You see, Mary was once a young woman who looked for love in all the wrong places. Scarred as a kid, she longed for the peace and happiness that she saw in other people. Driven by desires and longings that she couldn't or wouldn't control. She went down a dark, dark path of sin and deceit. You see, that once hopeful little girl was no longer even recognizable. Her life was filled with fits of rage, followed by fear and paranoia. Alienated from friends and family, it's safe to say that Mary was trapped in hell on earth. But by the grace of God, one day she met Jesus and everything changed because light cast out darkness. She began to feel again, to love again. And the scars, she began, they began to heal. She probably said, I'm sorry, please forgive me a hundred times for all the ways that she had hurt others. But now she could see her sin. She had been radically changed by Jesus and she followed him in his ministry everywhere that he went. She was there when he began his march towards Jerusalem. She warned and worried about the hostility of the Jewish leaders. She was there in the crowd the morning that they crucified him in horror and shock and disbelief. She was there with his mother at the foot of the cross with everything inside of her, trying to provide strength and support. And she was there when they quickly wrapped his body and laid him in a garden tomb. The stone rolled over and the guards put into place. And then early Sunday morning, Mary went to the garden tomb with spices and oil to finish caring for his body. Now the other gospels tell us that she went with a group of women, small group, but John wishes for us to focus on Mary. When she gets to the tomb, it's still dark. It's hard to see. But as she gets closer, she realizes the large stone has been rolled out of the way. She's startled and looks inside. He's gone. Someone has stolen his body. Now in a panic, she hurries to notify Peter and John. They've, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. And, and I don't know where that they have laid him. Now, this next part of John's gospel is my favorite part of comic relief in the entirety of the Bible. Because in verses three through 10, John tells us his account of coming to the tomb. Okay. Remember, he calls himself the other disciple. Listen to verses three through six. So Peter and the other disciple, that's John, went forth and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Then in verse five, John talks about looking into the tomb. And verse six, he says, and so Peter also came following him. In other words, when Peter finally got to the tomb. All right, talk about throwing some shade here. And by the way, this is brilliant. Because it's exactly the sort of thing that I would have included in the account. Guys, you have to know, like, when when the other disciples read John's account, uh, John, is this really necessary? And John's replies, guys, 
This is the most important event in all of history. Details matter here. All right, so if it happens to be that I smoked Peter in a race by like half a mile, all right, the people need to know. All right, they need to know that Peter's out of shape and showed up like 10 minutes later. And so John and then eventually Peter get to the tomb. They look in and they only see burial wrappings. The linens lie where Jesus's body once was. And the head covering is folded and off to the side. Now they are perplexed. They do not yet understand that the scripture uh, foretold the resurrection is coming. But verse eight tells us that John has a, a spark of belief, right? It's like he knew, I knew Jesus wasn't finished. And then Peter and John leave for their own homes. Mary followed behind Peter, Peter and John and their race. And as they hurry off in a haste, she lingers in the garden. Let me pause real quick and say that the details that follow here are astounding. Okay. They are not the details of a made up account for at this time in history, a woman's testimony had zero credibility. If she witnessed a crime, her testimony was not even allowed in court. So why does the Bible record an emotionally distraught woman as the first person to witness the resurrected Christ from the dead? Because that's how it happened. Verse 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. See, Mary weeps of a confused, broken heart. Because she who has sinned much has been forgiven much and loves much. And she is still thinking of, in terms of a dead Jesus. The word used for weeping here is actually a strong word. It's the same word used for the mourners who show up at Lazarus's death. That's the sort of weeping and wailing that's taking place. And she weeps because the nightmare continues. After all that they've already done to Jesus, Mary assumes that his body has been stolen by those who wish to make further sport of him. Will they desecrate his dead body? She loved the Lord, respected him, cherished him, wished to honor him. But for a moment still, the nightmare continues. Mary weeps because the confusion causes her dark past to fill her mind with doubt. All that she used to be, the depression, being enslaved to sin, would she become that again? And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, right? As if one last time, And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus was lying. It's like through tear filled eyes, right? She sees two men in white. Now she does not yet know later. She will know that they are angels right now. They're just two men. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Now in a second, Jesus is going to ask the same question. Why are you weeping? A question of concern, but I'm certain that it is said with anticipation of hope because those who are asking the question already know there's no reason for weeping. Now there have been many times in the Smith household with young children that certain favorite stuffed animals have been lost. Okay. And rooms have been scoured and the children are always the first to give up hope and to sit and to succumb to the fear and the dread that sheepy has been lost forever. 
Now, what they don't know, number one, is that parents are way better lookers, okay? It's like the peanut butters on the second shelf in the pantry. I have no clue where it is, all right? So parents are way better lookers, but two, catch this, we had replacements. Because when one stuffy becomes so important, right, that you cannot live without it, we bought backups. This is a parenting life hack that you must employ, okay? So now imagine the scene. There's the four-year-old child on the foot of the bed and sorrow and weeping and all hope is lost. Sheepy is gone forever. And then dad asks, why are you weeping? Do you hear the hope? Because I know Sheepy's about to return. But Mary does not. Why are you weeping? Verse 13, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And then turning around, possibly the angel's motion for her to look behind her. And she sees a man that she assumes is the gardener, but it's Jesus. Her eyes are filled with tears. She's scarcely making eye contact. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Now that is a great question for Mary and for every one of us this morning. Who is it that you are looking for? Now, the simple answer is that she was looking for Jesus. She was looking for him, but she was looking for him amongst the dead, right? She's hoping to better prepare his body for decay. She was looking for the living one amongst the dead. And so no wonder she didn't recognize him. Verse 15, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Friend, you are here this Easter Sunday morning and I ask you, who is it that you are looking for? A savior, a king, someone who knows you and loves you in spite of your sin, because Jesus is all of those things, but you will not find him amongst the dead. And then Jesus called her by name, Mary. And she looked up and she refocused her eyes. It's him, living, breathing, speaking, Jesus, you're alive. And she calls him rabbi and she clings to him. You see, the one who willingly laid down his life three days later had the authority to take it back up again. And he got up from the dead. And Mary is now face to face with him. You see, the resurrection of Jesus reverses everything. Fear is calmed. Mourning is turned to comfort, sorrow to joy, confusion and uncertainty are now seen as God's magnificent plan and death has been defeated. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees that the son of God has accomplished, that the law has been fulfilled and sin is paid in full because the resurrection is the receipt and Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. Now what it must have been like for her to race back, to tell the other disciples, the greatest news in history Okay, the adrenaline that was running through her veins, the hair that's standing up on her arms. He lives, he lives, and death has been swallowed up in victory. And he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. 
not an apostle, not the Sanhedrin, not a synagogue, not even a group of men. Mary Magdalene, a woman who had known great sin and evil, who came to the tomb confused and brokenhearted. Friend, that should give every single one of us great comfort this morning. For blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In fact, poor in spirit is the only way that you can come to Jesus. For God opposes the proud. Now Mary knew that she was a sinner. She had no pretense of trying to impress people with her goodness. It was by her faith alone in Jesus that she was saved. Does the Holy Spirit of God convict you this morning that you are a sinner in need of a savior? Friend, who are you looking for today? Because if you are here out of obligation, because it's Easter and this is what we do, I'm just here to please grandma. Then check the box, mission accomplished, on to lunch. But tragically, you miss the point. Like those on the train who are preoccupied with coffee and ice cream, ignoring the death of the sun. And tragically, you are still in your sin. You know the other part of the train illustration where it breaks down? Is that there is no salvation without conscious participation. In other words, you can't be saved without looking upon the sun. Jesus' blood is sufficient to save the whole world. But you can't be cleansed unless you call upon him personally. Are you here today looking for a savior, a king, someone who truly knows you and loves you, even in spite of your sin? If so, I have good news for you. Jesus is alive and he is willing and ready to save any and all who will come to him with complete trust, admitting that they have sinned and fall short of God's standard. And their only hope is the finished work of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Right? If you have no pretense of your own goodness before a holy God, but if you are ready to say that Jesus paid it all, then Jesus is alive and he is ready and willing to save you. The question is, will you call out to him? With every head bow and every eye closed, this Easter morning, I want to offer you, friend, a chance to respond to the gospel. If you have never placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus, you can right now. God is near. And if the spirit convicts you, you must respond. You can call to him and say, Father, I admit to you, I'm a sinner. And because of my sin, my sin separates me from you. And I left to my own good works, I would remain separated from you. But I've heard good news that you love me enough to send your son and for him to die in my place. And then he resurrected from the dead. I place all of my trust in the finished work of Jesus. Will you forgive my sin right now? And will you come into my heart? Jesus, I love you. And with your help, I will follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.